Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A murder trial is now underway for a man accused in a deadly shooting at a Westside motel back in 2021. Leopoldo Mora is accused of the murder of Kenneth Salazar after allegedly shooting him during an argument. Erica Hernandez takes us inside the courtroom today as surveillance footage of what happened was shown to jurors. He grabbed his gun, he squeezed the trigger, and he killed him. That is what this case is about, ladies and gentlemen. Prosecutors quickly laid out their case for the jury. Leopoldo Mora is accused of fatally shooting Kenneth Salazar outside the Paradise Motel off West Commerce on June 13th, 2021. Attorney Raul Jordan says a big part of their evidence will be witness testimony and surveillance footage that apparently captured the entire shooting on camera. You are going to have the very rare opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to witness the crime with your very eyes. That surveillance footage was shown to the jury. In it, you see the moments a gun is pointed out of a motel room and then Salazar falling in the parking lot. Prosecutors say Mora is the one seen walking out of the motel room and leaving the scene in a red vehicle. As for the defense, they chose not to give opening statements today, so we'll have to wait for later this week to see what their case is about. As for Mora, if he's found guilty, he is facing up to life in prison. At the Cathedral Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. If Friday's deadly dog attack highlighting one of the most severe outcomes for what continues to be a pervasive problem in San Antonio. Animal Care Services says a large part of the more than 87,000 calls for service that it received last year were for animals on the loose. An ACS spokeswoman says the loose dogs they often come across have owners. People use the word stray and a lot of people automatically assume, oh gosh, you know, that's a homeless dog, maybe a dog that doesn't have a home or lives on the streets. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. We have a lot of people in San Antonio that need to be more responsible with their pets. As you can see, a lot of the pets that we saw today when we were out and about had actually collars on them. This is not the case for the three dogs that ACS euthanized after the attack had been involved in at least three other biting incidents before. He was only 18 years old at the time of his death, and now more than a month later, San Antonio police are still looking for a murder suspect in this case. Jonathan Heredia was found shot and killed on January 11th at the Via Espada Apartments on Clubhouse Boulevard. That's not too far from Highway 281 and the Mission Del Lago Golf Course. Police say Heredia was shot in the back seat of a car while meeting up with someone at that apartment. Anyone with any information is asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP and you can remain anonymous. To some developing stories now, a motorcyclist in the hospital for several broken bones after his cycle crashed into a car last night. That crash happened about 1040 on Blanco Road near 1604. San Antonio police still trying to determine what led up to the crash, but say the motorcyclist was thrown from his bike. He was taken to University Hospital with broken bones. No charges expected against either driver. A former college student convicted for shooting and killing a Texas Tech University police officer has been sentenced to life in prison. 24-year-old Hollis Daniels was sentenced in the 2017 murder of police officer Floyd East. Then 19 years old, Daniels was arrested by university officers for possessing a controlled substance and held at the Texas Tech Department offices where Officer East was working. When the two were left alone, Daniels shot Officer East in the head and ran before eventually being arrested. He will not be eligible for parole. A celebration of a life well lived. Today, hundreds, thousands filled the Tobin Center to remember, honor, and celebrate the life and legacy of Red McCones. Our Max Massey at the Tobin Center throughout the day and spoke to those in attendance who say Red's achievements continue to shape our city today. He really, really loved the journey. This is a man that understood his priorities and they started at home. His reach is incomprehensible. I mean, it's so far and wide, it's, it's pretty amazing. Red McCombs leaving behind a lasting legacy. A legacy as a family man, a businessman, and a philanthropist. It's, it's everything. I mean, you see what he's contributed to the University of Texas Austin, Southwestern University, and to UT Health Science Center. He's an icon in regards to philanthropy. So many people here today 
telling me how he was larger than life, instrumental in the growth of San Antonio and the state of Texas. He meant everything. I mean, he helped put San Antonio on the map. Uh, he took a big gamble to bring the Spurs here, uh, took a personal financial gamble to bring the team here, and uh, obviously it's paid off and it's helped bring a lot of recognition to San Antonio. So he's part and parcel. He might also put Red McCombs after Bear County, San Antonio. Red McCombs, known as a businessman, a philanthropist, and a communications magnet, but those who knew him well knew he was a family man. And at the funeral service, you had this program, and in it, a list of quotes from Red's family that had put in there. One of the ones at the top, time with family matters most. He was almost like a father figure for a lot of people, not just us, but a lot of people in the community. That was the theme of what so many said today. Red McCombs working to make our community a better place. He always meant well and he always wanted to protect this community and especially the most vulnerable. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. A huge legacy that will live on. Take a look now at this dust storm in the Lubbock area. This happened over the weekend as some areas in Texas dealt with severe weather. In Memphis, Texas, northeast of Lubbock, a cold front brought wind gusts of 114 miles an hour. That's Category 2 hurricane strength. There were also severe storms across the Panhandle and in Oklahoma. This dust traveled as far as the DFW area, Austin, and Houston. That almost looks like something you see out of the Middle East. Yeah, you're right. Like, what do they call them? Haboobs or uh, what do they call yes. them that, that, go, that, go, that you see across the deserts in the Middle East? Yeah, and it really was a dust storm. You know, it was one of those because of the high winds blowing the dusty ground. If you don't have crops in, you don't have anything to hold down that uh, soil, then you get those dust storms and those significant winds. I think Guadalupe Peak had a gust of over 90 miles per hour. And these are non-thunderstorm wind gusts. Keep that in mind. Get ready for some wind later this week. Some serious wind again. We'll talk about that in a moment. First of all, temperatures today. Hey, 91 Catula, that's our hot spot. Laredo, 90 degrees. 87 are high here in town. Right now we're at 83. Cool enough pretty efficiently this evening with a clear sky, dry air, and even calming wind. Uvalde now 86, 80 in Converse along with Seguin and Bulverde 84. Low humidity, comfortable. That Calming wind, allowing temperatures to get down to 67 at 10 p.m. By midnight, we're at 62 degrees. And tomorrow morning, I think we'll start in the low to mid 50s. 54 around San Antonio. You get into the upper 40s, Pipe Creek, Bandera, Comfort area. About 53, Divine, Poteet, and Pleasanton. We'll talk about our next cold front, which brings some very gusty winds. We'll talk about when it's going to get gusty, if there's any hope of rain with that front in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Well, after nearly three weeks of fun and competition, the rodeo grounds are emptying out. For the kids who showed off their livestock, many are leaving with a pocket full of money that was more than they expected. That extra money is thanks to the enthusiasm of a group of rodeo fans who call themselves the San Antonio Roses. Our Ursula Perry with how they have changed the junior livestock auction with just a yellow rose. And just like that, another San Antonio Junior Livestock Show competitor gets to walk away $500 or more richer. Champs like Stratton's Shirts, who came all the way from Ropesville with her shorthorn steer. What's your steer's name? Nitro. Nitro? Yes, Hi, Nitro. <laughs> but as Nitro saunters into the spotlight at the auction, no one is chill, especially not the Roses, who are ready with their flowers to bid him up. San Antonio Rose. $1,000. Final take at the auction, 13 grand. They fundraised all year with events like Rodeo Rehab Thrift Store. Coming to the auction ring with a whopping $125,000 to bid on these animals and these kids' futures. We are going to support these kids, and especially those kids that don't have a lot of money coming across the stage. Well, when kids walk across that stage for like $3,000, that's ridiculous. It takes $6,000 to feed the steer for a year. Some kids stand alone before the crowd with just their ribbons and a smile. They, too, get Rodeo Roses love. And they get so excited. And the roses, what they do besides supporting monetarily, they bring energy to the room. And the kids, if they get roses, they come through the ring with roses. And they're just, they love the support that we give them, even just emotionally. And that's how it goes all day, till the final child leaves the ring. 
Now the Roses are already planning new ways to raise money in 2024. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. It has been a little over two years since that winter storm left millions of Texans in the dark and in the cold. So what's changed since then to keep that from happening again? That's what we're focusing on in a new case that explains today what action lawmakers have taken, plus a plan they're considering right now that would change the Texas energy market. This plan is is untried, untested, unproven, never been done before. It's a credit plan, but one with a lot of questions. What this idea could mean for your energy bills. KSAT explains is at 630. Our big winter storm happened two years ago, but there are parts of the country dealing with big storms right now, maybe even worse. We have the latest on the storms nationwide that are bringing tornadoes, snow and heavy rain. Let's take a look outside right now. Traffic here and an issue out on the roads. 410 at Ray Ellison Boulevard. Emergency crews there on the scene. They responded to a crash. Two lanes, the shoulder all blocked off right now. We're going to keep an eye on things to see how this progresses. Hopefully the cleanup comes soon. And our Stephen Cavazos will have the latest on road closures happening around the city this week. Up next. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez. This is what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. It's a big day in our state's capital. Families of the Rob Elementary shooting victims are making their way to Austin ahead of a gun reform rally, which is set to take place tomorrow. Our Lee Waldman is in Austin tonight and she's going to give us a preview. Also, a pair of horses are on the road to recovery. The Bear County Sheriff's Office rescued those animals after they discovered them living in horrible living conditions. We're going to tell you what else they found. Those stories and so much more when we see you tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, it's another work week, which means construction crews will be out working on roads around our city, maybe even causing some closures. Stephen Cavazos with what you need to look out for and the different routes you can take to get around it. February is wrapping up and road closures are expected to take us all the way into the late days of March. So let's talk about what you can expect. Plan that commute ahead of time, especially if you're traveling along 281 on the north side of San Antonio, because we have that asphalt work that continues to take place. Now that will start on Monday, February 27th and wrap on Tuesday, February 28th. This does start at nine in the morning, folks, and should wrap at three in the afternoon. We will see alternating lane closures in both directions right there at Wilderness Oaks. So I would say expect some slowdowns. All right, let's take a jump now over here to Loop 410 on the south side of San Antonio, where roadway repairs will hopefully make the commute a little bit easier for drivers. That's been current and should wrap on Friday, March 3rd. It begins at 8 in the morning and should wrap at 5 in the afternoon. What drivers will see out there are various eastbound mainland closures from Somerset Road to South Presa Road. All right, one last jump here to Loop 1604 on the northeast side of San Antonio, where we have demolition work that is taking place. Now, this begins on Wednesday, March 1st, and hopefully we'll see that wrap up on Monday, March 27th. This is a long term closure, guys. So what we'll see out there is a westbound to eastbound loop 1604 turnaround closure right there at Lookout Road. And again, that is for demolition work. I know it's a lot of information, but what you can do is scan this QR code that takes you to our case at traffic page, and I've updated a list of closures on that site. So again, plan your commute ahead of time. The Sky 12 at the San Antonio International Airport. By the way, the airport getting a $20 million grant from the Federal Aviation Administration. And that money is going to go towards the new facility there, the new terminal that will have five gates, more seating for travelers. We saw all those renderings a couple of weeks ago yep. now about what this new airport project will look like. And we've talked to the mayor right here on the News at 6 about how it's all going to be paid for, he says, by grants like this one and money from the airlines themselves. All right, 84 degrees. You might think that's warm, but hold on. <laughs> We've got warmer. We do. We've got a little bit warmer in the days ahead before our next drop off. Of course, it's south central Texas, so we're going to see some noticeable changes in just a few days. Enjoy this warmth while it's here, and if you like the cooler temperatures, well, your opportunity is just around the corner. Speaking of cooler temperatures, our mornings will be taking a hit by Friday through the weekend. So tomorrow morning, 54, Wednesday and Thursday with return of humidity, we're looking at morning readings in the mid 60s. No jackets necessary. We'll get to the high temperatures in a bit. 
Until we get into Friday, that's when you may want a light jacket in the morning at 45 and Saturday morning at 42. So that morning temperature trend, it goes up and then falls off again, but we're not looking at a freeze. Take a look at the current readings across the state. Some 60s up north, 70s and then 80s mixed in everywhere else. Laredo, Del Rio, both at 88 degrees, 85 in Pleasanton. Catula from a high of 91 now at 89. Tomorrow morning, low to mid 50s for most of us. Then by the afternoon, we're talking well into the 80s. 87 here in San Antonio, Eagle Pass 92, Carrizo Springs, Crystal City about 93, Catula and Laredo 94 for the high temperature tomorrow. So feeling very spring like tomorrow and really even as we go into Wednesday and Thursday. Converse 86 tomorrow, Elmendorf 88 and Hondo checking in at 90. That's our forecast high. Very similar. Wednesday and Thursday. Actually, Thursday has the potential to become our first 90 degree day this year, but then the bottom falls out a bit and we're back down to 72 for a high by Friday. So from near 90 to near 70, just like that with our next cold front. And then we'll have highs in the mid 70s through the weekend. Also, you'll notice some changes in just not just how it feels in terms of the temperature, but mugginess outside. Dew points now very dry. They're low. Dew points are down in the 20s and even low 30s. But gradually tomorrow, you'll notice a change and an increase in that mugginess. And our future cast shows that, especially tomorrow evening, these dew points will climb mid, maybe even some upper 60s out there. So you'll notice some stickiness start to increase throughout the day tomorrow. And that's important because it will affect the Wednesday morning commute with areas of fog. Wednesday and Thursday, I do think we'll have areas of fog for those commutes. And notice those dew points well into the 60s Wednesday and Thursday. Then that cold front hits some very dry air behind it and extremely gusty winds. So let's talk about that next system that's going to be affecting us. First of all, one across the Great Lakes area headed into New England. The one we're watching is this swirl near Seattle and Portland. That's an upper level disturbance, counterclockwise circulation. It's going to be dropping southward. It's got some decent moisture with it right now throughout the western U.S. Higher elevation snow, lower elevation, moderate to heavy rain, and that's going to spread eastward into the Rocky Mountains and even the desert southwest. Some parts of Texas as well will get some decent rain from this and even some thunderstorms. I just think it's going to mostly be north of us. So our rain chances, we give it about a 10% chance. Thursday night. That's about it. If we're lucky, some locations east of town, Hallettsville, Shiner, Moulton, Quero, Yorktown, you could see a shower or two, but I think for the rest of us, it's uh, pretty unlikely for that to happen. The main headline with that system and its associated cold front is going to be the wind by Thursday afternoon and Thursday evening. I think starting about 5 p.m., we could see some wind gusts around 50 miles per hour. And that'll be the case Thursday night and even early Friday morning until subsiding by Friday afternoon. So dry, cooler and becoming windy with that next cold front that hits late on Thursday. Here's your case at 12 hour forecast 54 at 7 a.m. tomorrow by noon. We're at 80 degrees, nothing but sunshine throughout the day. 87 our afternoon high, but as I showed you closer to the Rio Grande into the 90s. Unfortunately, that's our only little chance at rain. Just that 10% Thursday night. Cross your fingers for a pattern shift because we're going to need it before we settle into spring and summer. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. There are some very talented high school hoopsters in our community, Larry. Yeah, the girls basketball season is winding down this weekend. Saturday, we will crown some state champions. We have three local teams in the state tournament, Wagner, Clark, and Bernie. Plus, in women's college basketball, Trinity is getting set to host some Division Three tournament games this weekend coming up. We stopped by Wagner High School this morning where the girls basketball team is getting ready to play Frisco Liberty in the Class 5A state semis Thursday night at the Alamo Dome. Wagner beat Liberty Hill 64-48 in the 5A regional final Saturday to advance to the state tournament for the first time since 2015 when they were in Class 6A. Wagner is led by two awesome guards in Savani Sancho and L.A. Sneed. The team is ready to go knowing they are two wins away from a state championship. It's just amazing. Like the past two years that I've been at this school, I wasn't able to make it past the first round. And now that we came all the way to the sixth round, I'm just so excited. For me to finally 
good to be able to go to state and I actually get my mom to be able to because she's been close many times but she's never officially done it so just knowing that I was on, on the team that she made it to state with was a big accomplishment. Definitely special to share that moment with uh, with LA with my daughter um, just all the hard work not just she put in but all the girls as well but um, it's definitely like a special moment to be able to share that with your kid. Uh, a lot of people don't get to do that, uh, get to coach their kid, and I'm very grateful that I get to coach her and experience a state tournament with her. In Class 6A, the Clark Cougars have advanced to the state semis in back-to-back -back seasons. The Cougars got here by beating Brennan 57-38 in the regional final. Now the number one 6A team of the state will next face number 11, Capel. Clark had to replace five seniors from last year's state semifinal roster, and they managed to do that and defend their regional title. I'm tremendously proud of them. I mean, like half of these teams were on, they were on our JV last year. A couple of them, because of transfer roles, were ineligible to play varsity. So they were on our JV, they were on our scout team, um, and now they're getting the opportunity to be here too. So it's a really special moment for them. We know we had a target on our back from the start. Um, we made a name for ourselves last year, and I think that really helped us this year. Uh, keep that name and keep the target on our back because we're not, we're not backing down from any competition, but using that as motivation to get us there in one state. And in Class 4A, the Lady Greyhounds of Bernie are getting ready to invade the Alamo Dome to play Sunnyvale. Bernie advanced the state after beating Fredericksburg 49-40 in the regional final. Here are those matchups. The Wagner girls will tip off first at the Alamo Dome. They'll face Frisco Liberty in the state semis Thursday night at 7. Next in Class 4A, 35-1 Bernie will hoop with Sunnyvale in the state semis Friday afternoon at 3. And in Class 6A, Clark will play Capel Friday night at 7. All state championship games will be held on Saturday. In women's college basketball, the Trinity Tigers won their third straight Southern Collegiate Athletic Conference Championship at beating Colorado College 64-54 in the conference tournament final yesterday. Josie Napoli and Maggie Shipley led the Tigers with 17 points each. Trinity forced 29 turnovers, leading to 26 points. And junior Maggie Robbins was asked what made this year's squad so special. I think our great group of seniors, there's six of them. They've two of them been through injury, Addie Putnam and Claire Harrell, but they're awesome. Maggie Shipley and Ashlyn Milton have been here. And same with Emily Nelson and Danny, they're the cheerleaders on the bench right now. There are like calmness. They help us throughout all of it. They're just like catch our breath, the little words, little high fives here and there, but they're definitely help us. Trinity will host the first two rounds of the NCAA Division III tournament. They'll play UT Dallas Friday at 5.30. Hardin Simmons will face Redlands Friday night at 8. The winner of those two will meet up Saturday night at 8 in the regional final right here in San Antonio. So it's going to be a very busy weekend for us. All kinds of hoop games Heck going yeah, on this man. weekend. yeah, man. We've got some good basketball here in town. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. What has changed since that disastrous winter storm two years ago? There's a big plan being considered right now and it could eventually affect what you pay for power. We explain this credit idea in case that explains next. This time two years ago, thousands of Texans had the same question. What will state leaders do to make sure we don't go without power or water for days in another weather emergency? Yeah, it's been more than two years since the February 2021 winter storm that wreaked havoc on Texas and contributed to the deaths of hundreds of people. And in this case, that explains we look at what action has been taken since then and how an idea that's being considered right now would change the Texas energy market. After the snow and the ice of February 2021 had melted and power and water service had finally been restored, catastrophe turned to criticism. How could a state known for energy production get so dangerously close, just four minutes and 37 seconds away from a massive grid collapse that could have wiped out power in Texas for months? Lawmakers went to work. That legislative session in Austin, there were 185 bills filed related to the February freeze. In the end, two main pieces of legislation were signed into law, Senate Bill 2 and Senate Bill 3. So what SB 2 did was essentially change the governance of ERCOT. ERCOT's board is no longer self-selecting or self-perpetuating, like, like many corporate boards would be. And it's appointed by a commission or a group appointed by the governor and the legislature. 
SB3 had two big parts. One was this requirement for energy producers and transmission utilities and natural gas producers to weatherize their equipment. So a lot of people talked about that in the immediate aftermath that they needed to prepare, you know, their actual physical structures better against extreme cold. But the legislation didn't specify how to weatherize. That was left up to the Public Utility Commission to decide for electricity providers and the Texas Railroad Commission to decide for natural gas generators. But SB3 was very vague in how this was going to be implemented. In fact, it was so vague that the Railroad Commission really didn't do anything until there was a, a huge public outcry. In August of 2022, the Railroad Commission laid out its weatherization requirements, although still somewhat vague. Things like correct failures that occurred during previous weather emergencies, install equipment to mitigate weather-related operational risks, and do internal inspection and self-assessment to protect critical components. Starting this year, electricity providers have to meet the weatherization rules created by the Public Utility Commission. Some of those rules include maintaining freeze protection equipment and making sure additional fuel supplies are stored and available during a winter weather emergency. The PUC plan has requirements for summer heat as well, but weatherization was only part of SB3. And the other big piece of this was to try to make the grid stronger in times when wind and solar energy weren't running um, you know, very strong, like if the sun has set or the wind's not blowing. So that's what legislators this session are really focusing on. And there's a big idea in front of legislators right now, one that the Public Utility Commission unanimously approved, but wants lawmakers to weigh in on before it goes any further. It's something called the performance credit mechanism. This plan is super controversial. This plan is, is untried, untested, unproven, never been done before. Here's how it's supposed to work. Power providers like CPS Energy could buy credits from power generators. Those generators would sell those credits on the promise that power providers can cash them in for extra power when it's needed most, like during extreme weather. The PUC chairman has said two things. One is that it could increase capacity so maybe more plants would be built. And in fact, there are power generators who have said they're going to build more gas plants if this goes into effect. But it also would incentivize kind of these older plants to stay around a little longer. It would create a new revenue stream to boost power capacity in Texas. So why can't power generators just increase capacity now? Texas only pays the generators when they actually are producing electricity. Texas is an electricity only market. Power generators only get paid for the power they're providing, not what they could provide. The coal fired plants, the natural gas plants, they're not in the game year in, year out, day in, day out. And so if you're if you have to build a plant to operate for all of August, but you're only going to get revenue in August, it doesn't pay off. Hers believes fossil fuel generators need to be paid more to provide more. It's what's called dispatchable energy, meaning it can be turned on fast. But he argues this credit idea is flawed. The companies know that if if they accept the money today and don't show up with the electricity tomorrow, they have a very easy way out. They can just simply file bankruptcy. Federal bankruptcy court trumps the Public Utility Commission and ERCOT every time. But the Public Utility Commission, which is overseeing this effort, has said there's going to be a penalty. Um, the problem is we don't know yet what that penalty is going to be because it hasn't been decided. Environmental advocates are concerned the credit plan would encourage building more fossil fuel plants. Renewable energy production like wind and solar is certainly growing in Texas, but the technology to store that kind of power isn't widely available yet. But for them to take the reins today, the renewable fleet, the wind and solar fleet needs to be two, three or four times as large as it is. Over the next five to 10 years, we need to keep the coal and natural gas plants available to run. When we need that power, we desperately need it. So what does CPS Energy think of this credit idea? That's one of several questions that I asked the head of CPS two years after that awful winter storm. Our job is to make sure that never happens again, which is why the state figuring out this policy is so important. 
this will help us ensure that that year never happens again. Here's another big question. What could this mean for your utility bill? More of that interview and the answer when case that explains continues next.